and I am uh, always thrilled to be with all these people who I feel like know so much more than me. I just honor all of you who have been doing this work for a long time. That's enough. So, thank you. Um, so Lori, can we just, so for those who don't know, Lori is actually our newest member on the steering committee. And if she just wants to say a few words beyond, hi, I'm the tech guru. Thank you so much, Carolina. Um, my, well, my name is Lori Stone-Sartosky. I'm in Indianapolis, Indiana. I'm, I work for the Church of the Larger Fellowship as the Director of Technology, and I've been a Unitarian Universalist for over 20 years now. I'm excited to be joining the steering committee for UU Allies for Racial Equity and look forward to continuing to build uh, relationships within the uh, organization, across organizations, and across the denomination. Awesome. So I am, again, I'm Carolina Cravart Graham. I am in Arizona. I started on the ARE steering committee as GA coordinator, and I've now moved to conference coordinator. Um, I've done some ARAO, anti-racist, anti-oppressive training, um, but the lens I bring mostly to our work is centered in nonviolent direct action and activism, both inside and outside Unitarian Universalism. And I work on countering impression, oppression in those environments. Um, I want to thank CLF so very much for partnering with us on this and helping us with the tech. Um, what, what fortune. Um, and I also want to thank all of the, the ARE steering committee members who um, helped make this happen, who kind of did this big, massive push in the end. Um, it's, been, it's been a joy. And as Carrie said, it's something we've been wanting to do for a very, very long time. So after, over the past few years, uh, many UUs have been getting more and more involved in anti-racism efforts, um, particularly around immigration back in 2010, 2011, and now most recently in Black Lives Matter. Uh, in our racial justice work, we often see the same challenges and bump into the same lessons over and over and over again. And it, feels sometimes like we are just reliving history and reliving history and reliving history. So I think, I think one of the most powerful things we can do is really get to the root of that history. Um, and when All we look slavery. at... It's actually called um, genocide. Yes, genocide is... Um, Genocide is one of the roots of that, but before the genocide, there was somewhere an idea that the white Eurocentric worldview, the colonizers worldview was the best worldview. And that essentially led to white supremacy and white supremacy gave rise to racism and genocide and indeed the country we live in today. About five years ago, I bumped into Tema Okun's analysis of white supremacy culture. Um, interestingly, in a workshop that was being given by Surge, which is showing up for racial justice, if you're not familiar with them, they're a wonderful resource uh, doing white ally work as well. Uh, I was pretty, pretty rattled by this analysis initially because I was, I felt that I was very, very hardcore into racism work, into anti-racism work. But then when I read it, I realized that, that all of the kind of traits that she names were not only around me in my community, but were within myself um, as well. And that was really, really disturbing for me. And I had to do a little bit of reflective work around that. So, I've been talking about this for a while and, and our friends on the steering committee and other people in ARE have been talking about the white supremacy analysis for a long time. Tema Okun, by the way, this article is uh, kind of a uh, synopsis of her book, which is called The Emperor Has No Clothes. Um, and I very, very much re recommend that book. But she is by far not the only one who brings a white supremacy analysis. Um, there's some great work out by Elizabeth Martinez, Sharon Martinez, um, 
and many, many other people, especially currently, are doing really, really impactful work around really examining white supremacy, how we dismantle that, because that is indeed the root. So um, we are going to, as Carrie said, we're going to go a little out of our comfort zone. Um, this is the first time we're trying to do, us three are trying to do a conversational format in a web environment. And we recognize that's a challenge. There are a lot of people in the room. We ask you bear with us. Um, I think I can speak for the group saying that um, we kind of consider this much more as a beginning of many, 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 many conversations to come. And we ask you, we, we're thankful that you're um, sharing our conversation and we're hoping to share in yours as we move forward. Um, so uh, we are going to try and actually have conversations around each of the topics. We initially wanted to do all 15 in one, but then we decided to combat the sense of urgency and the impatience we all had around this work and we split it in half. So this will be part one, and we will be covering eight topics today, seven topics next week, and do a little bit of a wrap up. And two of us will be in conversation around each particular topic. The third one will be monitoring the chat window to see if we can bring in some questions or some comments from the audience to make it easier on Lori. Um, and then we're hoping to do that within about 45 to 50 minutes. So we can actually have between 30 and 40 minutes for a really, really good discussion um, from everybody. We recognize that, and please we ask you to recognize, we are not here with the answers. Um, we're probably here with more questions than anything else. Um, but I think that articulating the struggle is sometimes um, the only thing we can do and helping one another um, with our various ranges of experience. I see a lot of people and a lot of friendly faces in the audience. I know some of you have been in this work so much longer than we have or that I have. So um, we're really looking for a conversation. So with that, I wanna talk a little bit about um, sense of urgency, which is my biggest demon. I, we've renamed that, or we can also call that impatience. Uh, I find that that Tim Okun's analysis is an incredible tool to, to, to really diagnose your organization or your community or even your family. But for me, it's become more powerful in looking in the mirror. And I find that in all of the challenges I face in justice work, mostly because in activism, we're always trying to put out fires and everything is always on fire and rush, 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 which sometimes leads to some very poor decisions. Um, I find that combating my own impatience is one of the, the most difficult things I do and something I have to work on on a daily basis. So I want to be in conversation with Donna, mm. who I have found to be much, much more patient than me and I'd like to know, Donna, where do you see this sense of urgency, this impatience showing up in you, in your community, in your congregations? Where do you see it? Also, um, it's, oops, whoops, um, here we go. I, I got you unmuted, Donna. Okay, thank you. Um, but we missed about the first sentence or so. Okay, so um, I find it in myself, being very honest here, as a minister um, in a congregation of wanting everybody to come along and being frustrated when there are people who aren't interested in doing the work and don't knew, know much about it. Um, so I, I have this sense of urgency all the time. We've got to be doing this. Um, I find it in myself also when I want there to be quick fixes for something. And um, I, I know that it can't be... Um, I was at a, 
a demonstration for Sandra Bland, a grand jury, and the person who was leading it, um, you know, was really clear about having all voices heard, but also, um, you know, that, that we are in this for the long haul. It has taken all these hundreds of years to get where we are, and it's not going to be a quick fix. So, um, you know, I, I, I try to look at it um, ministerially for myself and my congregants and everyone doing this work for what traits we need to have patience, of course, since we're talking about impatience, and forgiveness, uh, forgiving ourselves when we go too fast and we don't bring people along and we might be short um, and including people, being inclusive of all the different ways that we come to this work and all of our different styles. Awesome. So interestingly, in just hearing what you said, I, it, it echoed with me because almost every organizing space of color I have ever been in, um, or predominantly, people of color organizing, almost the first thing is, you know, this is lifelong work. This is, you know, it, this has been going on for 500 years and it's not going to end next Saturday. And that is, it's something that like I walk out the door and I forget it. Right. And then it's like, rush, rush, rush. Um, one of the things that I find is a great tool for me is I, I tend to be a very, very fast thinker. Um, I tend to focus on logistics a lot. So I get really, really impatient and really frustrated with anybody else who isn't thinking as fast as me. And that's really almost the entire planet because I'm in hyperdrive. But what I found is really, really beneficial and one of, the, one of my organizing partners and a great, great friend to me, my friend Rob Smith, is a much more slow and deliberate thinker and tends to be very, very considered and always tends to kind of like, no, 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 slow, no, let's wait, let's look, let's whatever. So I find one of the really cool tactics we can use um, is to intentionally partner with people who are either much faster or much slower than we are in order to start a, really understanding the value of different time orientations, right? And also, and also finding balance for us and for our community, right? To, because if we had my druthers, right, everything would be in a hyperdrive all the time. And then we would all be dead by next Saturday, right? <laughs> like, we can't do that. It's not a sustainable pace. So, um, but yeah, I want to get it all, all done, all the time and perfectly, right? Yeah. Oh, perfectly. <laughs> Perfectionism. That's another trait that comes up um, in white supremacy culture all the time, right? We have to be perfect or we can't do it. And we're uh, actually trying, probably, not necessarily intentionally modeling that tonight with this webinar because we know we're not going to get it perfect. Uh, but, you know, the, the importance of the topic and talking about it is more important than getting it a, a perfect presentation or a perfect webinar, right? So uh, the way perfectionism I know shows up for me is uh, not only being afraid to do something for fear of doing it incorrectly or making a mistake, um, but I also find that I um, have an internal critic in my head, not just for myself, but for other people who are working on things. So instead of focusing on the things that they're doing right, you know, part of my mind focuses on the things that they're doing wrong, right? And, um, and I know that, that that comes up for leaders all the time, that... You know, we have some pretty serious problems in our world that we want to solve, and we always want leaders to do that. But, you know, what happens the minute someone takes a leadership position, right? It's like putting a target on their back. And, 
Um, they're subject to all kinds of criticism rather than folks rallying around wanting to lend a hand, which might be a better way. So, so Donna, how does perfectionism show up for you in your work? So for me personally, what happens a lot of times with perfectionism is that I'll be slow to get started. I, I just, I don't think I have all the resources I need, just like doing this webinar tonight. Um, and so, you know, it, it keeps from even trying um, new things um, and talking to people and, you know, the academic background, it's like I have to know every single thing before any question that anyone would have, I have to have, know the answer to. and and no i don't and that is having some humility of really accepting that there are lots of people who have more experience and knowledge um, than me so um the you know the thing that i think is in the background for us all is to um to maintain personal dignity, dignity for ourselves and for others, instead of, you know, thinking things have to be perfect. Um, no, we're not perfect beings and we're not going to be and accept that in each other and um, acceptance and gratitude are the things that I think are a big antidote to perfectionism. Yeah, and I think uh, something that goes hand in hand with that is our fear of conflict, right? Um, right. We don't want to be uncomfortable, and uh, we don't want to make other people uncomfortable by disagreeing with them when they're, when they're working on something. Right. Um, we all we want to be polite. It's more. It's about more value to be polite. Yeah, and I think we ha we have to always um, keep on believing that the truth is more important than being polite. And finding that there's truth in the places we disagree, right? Yes. And helping us get to maybe a more understanding part or place. Yes. So it's important sometimes to raise difficult issues. Yeah, and how yeah. you do that is sometimes hard. And, you know, I, I think just saying that up front, you know, this is kind of hard for me to talk about. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm a little afraid of it, but I feel like it needs to be said. So please help me you know, listen to me and help me with this. Um, yeah, it seems um, we white folks are <laughs> especially sensitive at personal critique. And so we've got to, not only are, do we have that critic, but we also have a pretty big wall of defensiveness in, in yes. our relationships, you know, and um, we spend a lot of energy defending kind of our positions, who we are, what we say, you know, it's hard to acknowledge our mistakes or hard to acknowledge a difference or, or movement from our positions. Yeah, and that defensiveness, um, boy, for me, when I'm feeling it from myself, it is a um, really just kind of sit back, step back, take a deep breath, what's going on with me, why is this? Um, and, and then see if I can reframe my question to, um, I'm wondering, are I guessing that? And, you know, being able to restrain, restate it in terms that aren't, um, that don't feel so, um, so pushy. Um, right, right. I often try to find where's the common ground, you know, Absolutely. in terms of our interests. Yes. Because there's always overlap in our interests. And when you find that connection point, you know, um, you know, for example, a lot of times when talking about racism, 
you know, white people tend to get very defensive because they think that it's about them personally being a racist and they don't want to think about themselves that way. But for example, if you relate it to how women feel when they feel they've been a target of sexism, then you find that kind of spot where you can identify um, having that in common, you know, that, that oppression point. And sometimes that can help reduce defensiveness. Yes, yes. Come back to that um, safe space. And when we're in these spaces like we are today and Unitarian Universalist, um, that we go back to how we are with each other. What is our covenant with each other? To know sometimes we make special covenants, but I think that, that we all have one that we hold. Um, and um, I think part of that is, is having room for everyone, making room for, for everyone, that everyone, you know, or back to our first principle, has worth and dignity, even though they might be saying something um, in a way that, that you know, pulls up this reptilian part of our brain that we get so afraid of. So th that would be a great practice, right? To notice when that happens and to mm -hmm. go back to your sense of curiosity. You say, hmm, I'm noticing. <laughs> it's almost like a meditation practice, right? I'm yes. noticing that this is coming up for me and I'm feeling really defensive about that. What is that about? You know, instead of lashing out at the person who's saying it, maybe first we uh, take a minute with ourselves and ask those questions. Yeah, 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 it gets back to something for me of not saying it mean, be true to, you know, what you're saying, but um, you don't have to say it in a mean way. Right, 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 you know, so be gentle with yourself and others, right? <laughs> yes, yes, because we all need that gentleness, and what did I say, we're in antidotes to defensiveness is patience first and foremost and yeah. and praise when you know find you know if when you're feeling defensive if you can find something to be grateful for and the other and lift that up that can shift your mind also right and, and, and um, giving appreciations yes for for when people are are doing it kind of goes back to you know our being critical our perfectionism um, and being critical of people, you know, giving praise when you see someone is doing well. It's a great, a lot of people practice a gratitude practice. And That's it. That's it. And, and people find that comforting. Yeah. Which I, I have a, I have a quick question before you guys move on. Cause I know where you're going. Um, <laughs> I have a quick question because I've, I've actually, um, I, I noticed def def defensiveness is, is one of the huge things I notice also, not so much in myself, but in my environments. It's how quickly people are defensive. And I was just wondering if you had, I know we're talking a lot about looking in the mirror and looking inside, and I think that that's so important. But I wonder if any of you have any de-escalation tactics um, um, the only de-escalation, de or I don't even know if you could call it that, but basically a, a coping tactic, when I notice somebody is getting defensive, you know, I could maybe just make a notation and people might take that as a criticism. And then they're like, well, that's because I, and I'm like, well, that's defensive, right? I usually try and say, well, you know, you seem a little bit defensive. And I just, I wonder why, because I, you know, I just, said the sky was blue yeah. but I was wondering but that but when someone's already defensive right that they don't like being called defensive you know <laughs> right so I was just wondering if you guys had any strategies or tactics um that that um that you guys have found actually work or do you just back off no um no you don't have to back off and you don't have to tell them that they're defensive either because <laughs> that that's not a, a great tactic or, or an effective strategy. But just like I was mentioning about what you can do with yourself, say to the person, you know, what's coming up for you right now? When you notice, when you observe their behavior, 
you know, ask them how they're feeling. And usually there's emotion put in with that defensiveness, right? <laughs> they, get, right. they get red in the face or they could get heated or their voice gets louder or, um, you know, there's a lot of shifting in the seats. And so, you know, saying I'm noticing <laughs> that you got some energy around this statement, what's, what's coming up for you and try to get at what those feelings are behind that defensiveness. And what they're really, you know, feeling. Are they feeling hurt? Are they feeling attacked? You know, this is where we have to have empathy, you know, for other white folks in doing this work. Uh, because remember, we are all trained <laughs> to not talk about issues of white supremacy, right? It's supposed to be our best kept secret. So, uh, and I think defensiveness can show up in that way too, of not talking, of um, you know just retreating and and not engaging eye contact, not engaging in the conversation, and and that too of of noticing, being really aware of everyone in the room and especially if someone has been talking a lot and all of a sudden they're not of of recognizing that and 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 doing those things that you said carrie i i i wonder how you're feeling what's what's going on um and and in a curious way um and in, in an empathetic way that's empathy, right empathy goes a long way Right. Well, none of us gets enough of that. So, and yeah. I wonder if you guys just triggered me to bring this all back to my sense of urgency, right? Because <laughs> we're trying to get through this material, right? And then somebody gets defensive, and I'm like, no, but I have this trajectory. And I wonder if I should not, at that moment, if I see someone being defensive, and maybe I don't see a solution. Maybe it's oh. maybe it's something that we just need to leave be, right? Um, whether or not I have to start reflecting on my own impatience and my own sense of urgency and say, you know what, this is, maybe this is really raw for the person, right? There are a lot of people who are traumatized by white supremacy, you know, um, be, whether or not they're living a life of marginalization because of it, right. or whether or not they're so, they're so ingrained in this worldview that they see no other way. So when they're confronted with that, that can be very jarring. So I wonder if it's like, I'm going to try and do that in the future is I'm going to say, okay, well, somebody's really defensive, but maybe I'm too impatient and I should step back and say, okay, let's like, let's either sit with it. Right. And maybe, maybe just being uncomfortable with it. Right. Yep. So, and it definitely depends on who's in the room. Right. Um, if, 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 a white person is getting defensive about, you know, white racism and white supremacy. And there are people in the room, people of color in the room who are bringing up stories of their own experience of, you know, being marginalized or being the target of oppression or racism. Um, you know, you have to stand in solidarity with that person of color and to, you know, the, if anyone shows defensiveness, there's already going to be harm. So you have to try to minimize that harm and stand in solidarity with that with the person of color. Um, but if it's a room full of white people, I think it's a great opportunity, you know, to explore it. And, you know, going back to the perfectionism thing, <laughs> you know, nobody has all the, the roadmap or the perfect solution to end white supremacy culture. You know, if they did, I would hope it would already be gone. So we are gonna have to stumble our way through and just be brave and have courage and be strong. And fall apart when we need to, too. <laughs> so, um, you know, that sort of brings us to our feeling about uh, our right to comfort. You know, we have sort of been um, acculturated with this expectation that if we do all the right things, you know, we do well in school and we eat our vegetables and we obey the law and we listen to our parents and, you know, we grow up and we get a job or, you know, go to college or have a family, we do all the right things, you know, nothing bad is ever going to happen to us. Right. And nobody has a right to make me uncomfortable. I, uh, our culture is all um, built around our feeling comfortable. 
And um, I don't think that's in the Constitution. <laughs> I missed it if it was. <laughs> You know, I find it's it's interesting in in virtually any, um, and I do a lot of um, migrant justice work, um, both in my local community and kind of broader community. And one of the things that I I find it almost invariably when I have conversations with people who are immigrants to this country um, is that they're kind of shocked at the at the kind of the sense of security, including national security and whatever, that they feel people are entitled to here. And, and e even from some European countries, and I am an immigrant from a European country, so I have a, I have a little bit of an understanding of what, what the idea of security and safety and personal comfort and standard of living and all of that um, we seem to have this interesting expectation that here in America with the American dream and land of opportunity, right? We have, we get to have it all, right? right. If we do the right things, like you said. So uh, I love, I love this particular one, which I know some of you might be following along on the, on with the web link. And this is actually the very, very last um, trait that Tim Okun names, but I love it because for me, this is almost the easiest thing to work on, right? Because I think we all notice, at least personally, um, we all notice when we're uncomfortable, right? And I think we can often discern whether or not we're just uncomfortable or whether or not we're really afraid or we're really at risk or whatever. And so no, what I can notice instantaneously, I was in a, I was in a, a racial justice uh, conference on Saturday and I so instantly when certain things got said that I was very uncomfortable having people of color here from someone with pale skin, um, I noticed my discomfort immediately. I was just like, oh, am I so uncomfortable? And at that moment, I'm like, no, I'm here to be uncomfortable. Because the minute I'm uncomfortable, then at least somebody somewhere is comfortable. Um, can't always say who that might be. But that's something also that we, we were kind of thinking about a lot is that the, the moment we feel comfortable with the work, number one, it's not that great of a motivator because now we should maybe just have a beer and sit back and watch TV. Um, but the other thing is, is that the moment we were comfortable in a larger space, particularly a multicultural space, somebody else was bound to be uncomfortable. And we as white folks, when we're in the majority, we can start making assumptions a little bit about who is uncomfortable when we're feeling good. So. Right. Comfort at someone else's expense, oftentimes. Right. Yeah because the culture was, was really built for us. And so we should expect to feel emotionally and psychologically safe all the time, even when there are, um, you know, it, it, I mean, I can't help but think of police brutality when people are uh, being killed in the streets, right? But we should not, somehow we have an expectation that we should not be um, that should not disrupt our sort of our world. Is that what you're talking about, Carolyn? Yeah, I just want to say I'm. I, although Donna is the one who's who's monitoring the chat feed, I'm also I'm a terrible terrible multitasker, and I would just like to bring this in um, that uh, somebody somebody wrote, and I'm not sure how to exactly pronounce their name, um, but it said defensiveness. I'll be defensive until I feel safe and safety in these conversations is rooted in relationships and in the conversations recurrence. And I think that's really interesting to think about um, and comfort. I haven't been comfortable since I started engaging in anti-racism work in 2003. <laughs> what a surprise. <laughs> One task is to inculturate other white people into discomfort. And I absolutely agree. 
um, with that. And that brings up for me a conversation actually that we had at our, in, in our, in our conference, our last conference in New Orleans, when someone spoke in our circle and said, this work is not safe and this work will never be comfortable. If you're comfortable maybe in a training situation or maybe in an organizational situation, that's one thing but you will never be wholly comfortable and you will never be wholly safe because this is exactly work that's challenging the status quo. So for me, again, this is kind of easy. If I feel comfortable, I'm starting to already think, and I've been working, like I said, I've been working with this particular frame of reference for a long time now, but if I feel comfortable, I start wondering what might be wrong. <laughs> so... <laughs> So, um, you've gone to the other side. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and so whenever we, we do feel we're in a situation where we don't feel that optimum comfort or, you know, emotional or psychological safety, we think that, some, that not only is something wrong, but we've been wronged, right? It's, it, it almost feels like an attack to our world. Um, because all of the systems in our society have been set up, um, you know, to make us feel comfortable. And I wanted to go back, um, you talked about standard of living, you know, our increased standard of living, just, it, it just keeps going up and up and up, right? Because that's capitalism. You know, we have to want more things and have more stuff and be more comfortable and make our life easier. So it just, it's per self perpetuating that way. Um, and that's hard to, you know, unglue from. It's really hard. Um, and yeah, and it, it takes, it, it takes, you have to be conscious to take a step into the discomfort. You really yeah. do. Yeah, because if we look at kind of the trajectory in which we talked about it, right, the minute where our comfort is threatened, then we get defensive, and then, but we don't want to have an open conflict, and then we, right, and then it's almost like a, Regression. I remember a conversation we were having earlier, you know, you and I, Carrie, where you said that, like, we really need to recognize that white supremacy has been put, has, it has operated through racism and every other unequal way of, of treating people, right, to divide, Right. Initially, the way racism was brought into this country and put into law, it is to divide. Right. And and what do we do when we get defensive and we don't want to have a conflict? We withdraw and we pull away. And so from our right to comfort, if we follow that through in a natural emotional trajectory, we're pulling away and separating ourselves even more from each other, right? right. That's so. exactly right. If we're all comfortable in our own little world, um, you know, that's uh, the comment about feeling safe through relationship. We absolutely have to work on building our relationships and building um, uh, a way to talk about the issue of white supremacy and white supremacy culture um, through our relationships because yeah, we are supposed to be divided, so we don't talk about this stuff, and that's another way that the system perpetuates itself. So there's, you know, we all recognize the trait of individualism, right? Individual effort, uh, individual achievement. We've all gotten here by, you know, I live in Texas, so I know all about bootstraps. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, uh, yeah, and that is... Yeah, wow. So I almost feel like we just made a cool little circle, right? <laughs> <laughs> These things are all related. You know, um, in her book, uh, The New Jim Crow, Michelle Alexander talks about the wires on the bird cage of mass incarceration. We also have, these are the wires on the bird cage of white supremacy culture. Yeah. You know, all of these traits, and they are definitely related. So. So individualism has always been a challenge for me, um, partly because I come from, I come from a Germanic culture originally, and I grew up in the United States most of my life, and both of those are are pretty significantly. If anyone here is is familiar with Gerrit Hofstede's work of the cultural dimensions theory, 
you know, both of those cultures are significantly on the side of individualism. Um, I thought it was really interesting how, how Temo Kuhn's analysis kind of overlapped with Hoff's did a lot, right? A lot of the dimensions he talks about are kind of like extreme acts, aspects that she talks about. So, but bizarrely, I was always a collectivist. So when I'm confronted with this kind of, and I, I don't, I don't mean to be dismissive and cynical when I say, you know, things like this me, me, me culture, right? This kind of rather narcissistic culture. Well, and also competitive, right? We're supposed yes. to compete against one another. Yes. Yeah. And, and where, where essentially because of individual freedoms and I understand, you know, this country and how it was founded. Right. I, I understand that, that individual, we, we, we have a, a huge premium on personal liberty in this country for a whole lot of reasons. Right. But it, it is always a mystery to me because for me, I seem to have been born with a collectivistic mindset. So I'm, I'm challenged with this one is always a challenge for me because I, it's like there's certain things I don't get in the world and I don't get, uh, for me, it's always, you know, the whole, the whole takes precedence over like the part. Right. For me, that is, which in its extreme it is not healthy either. Right. Right. But I know what you mean because um, yeah, I feel like I'm a born collaborator. I like to work in collaboration with people. And, and my experience is always that um, the things you're able to do with a, another person or a group of people is, I always feel so much bigger than I could have come up with on my own. So um, it, it, it's a hard one for me to identify with a lot of times too. You know, not that um, as an individual, I wouldn't want to get credit or praise or, <laughs> you know, win awards for things I do. Um, but um, you know, I know I'm much more comfortable in a team um, working because, um, you know, and, and I think having our conversation tonight is, is an example. I wouldn't think of all these things to say if it were just me talking. It's in response to what you're talking about. And again, this builds our relationships. Right. And they're not, they don't come naturally for us. I want to go back over to the chat. I love that John Alou brought in Bernice Johnson Reagan saying, Coalition building doesn't happen in a womb. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think it's a skill that, uh, a trait that we're born with. And, you know, as babies, it's all about me. We have to be brought into the culture of, of being able to, um, share and get along and i think that sharing is something it's not really in what we're talking about now but um that that there's a sense that if i talk about these things i might lose some of my comfort and i won't have as much um yes and um and and Fred just talked about that too, um, that sacrifice, <laughs> sacrifice and white people, um, what we have to sacrifice to dismantle, um, you know, that is from such a place of comfort and and um, entitlement, and entitlement is a huge thing uh, in this. And so the, the challenge uh, I see as a minister, sometimes also in the right to comfort is um, people who are not doing this work at all in our very much Unitarian Universalism and very much um, white suburbs often places that um that it's a really slow start um to get people um to start looking at racial justice like 
you know, and it feels wrong to say this about Unitarian Universalists, but I think it's true. I think I think it does happen. This doesn't apply to me. And I've been really thrilled at the things that I have seen in the last year of all the different ways that people are starting out um, in their congregations and congregations are working um, together, you know, within their congregation and, and working in a larger scale. Like here in Houston, we have um, eight congregations and we have um, Houston UU Voices for Justice. And so, you know, when we, when we can all those of us who, who are slightly woke and want to do this work can um, go out and, and see others. It, it, it moves us away from that individualism, you know, that we see, you no, know, there are other people um, doing this. Um, and, and also I think the loneliness in it, right? I think there is, I think that, that we, I, I, I am so willing to bet that anyone here who has been doing this for more than 10 minutes has really felt that moment when you're like, I am the only person who, who is frustrated here. I am the only person who gets it. Okay. That might be a little bit arrogant, but sometimes that might make you also feel like, am I going crazy? Am I, you know, am I the only one seeing this? analysis for what it is am i the only one who sees the defensiveness or sees the the rushiness um and where that will take us and so i think there's there's a little bit of a danger and i i i know that temo kun's analysis doesn't go really deeply into the kind of i'm the only one mindset but i think we can take that as a huge launching point because there are two things i think that really really plague us and they're bizarrely what I feel are the same sides of each of a coin. It's the, I'm the only one coin. And the one is loneliness and feeling alone. And I think many, many people who have experienced marginalization and things like that have felt really, really alone in the world until they got into broader communities, until they found language for what they could talk about um, or what they were feeling that everybody told them wasn't real right oh no that's not real we're in a post-racial society right now right <laughs> you know and until they could get into communities they would feel very very alone and the other side of that coin i think is narcissism where or, or arrogance right where you know i'm the only one who knows how to solve this problem i'm the only one who gives as much as i can to the church right or whatever um so i think that I think that's, I, I, I love this particular thing because A, she left it wide open for us to have a lot of conversations about, um, a, about like kind of how individualism can manifest in this extreme way that actually just breaks us more, right? Whether it leads to loneliness or despair, right? Or arrogance, like it's breaking us. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I think that leads into the final thing that we're going to talk about before we open this up, because I see that we're right at we're already over time of of the either or thinking of the binary. You know, if I'm, you know, I'm the only one. It's the only way. There's only, you know my way or the other way and not moving into there are lots of ways to look at things right and we are right on target for time donna so no worries uh, yeah you know just today <laughs> just today here in texas uh, you know there was a demonstration of an anti-immigrant group um at a mosque that was welcoming um refugees of all kinds, not just Syrian refugees. Um, but the signs of this protest group said, you know, care for veterans before refugees. You know, and <laughs> our issues of caring for our veterans and our military families has been around a lot longer than this current refugee crisis. And to set that up as a binary, as either or, you know, it's just, it's a false um, uh, opposition. 
right? It's a yes. false choice. Um, and so we tend to fall into that trap that, and, and, you know, and that comes from our competition, our individualism, that all feeds into this thinking that, you know, you can only have it one way. And uh, you're either with me or against me. And that kind of uh, either or thinking is so dangerous and so counterproductive. There's a great, um, I've been using this uh, in workshops. Um, there's a great uh, exercise from improv called Yes And. If anybody's familiar with improv work, it's a very famous exercise. And, and what you do is that you float one idea to another person and they have to first respond with the words yes and 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 take it from there and it really it, you you find you struggle with it because we are so used to you know critiquing what someone does because it's not perfect and because your ideas are you know you have your in competition so your ideas have to be better and it, it just brings out the whole thing so that's that's a really fun antidote that i i use in board retreats um, I use an anti-racism workshop um, as a way of, of getting people to open up to other possibilities to counter that either or binary thinking. Right, right. And that, you know, the discipline I think we need for that is humility. And Absolutely. sometimes that is in short supply. Um, and we don't like getting called on that. Um, but I, you know, for me, it's a time to <clears throat> really slow it down. And, you know, from the improv work I do, it's like, let's all breathe together. <laughs> and I just had someone tell me they didn't appreciate being told to breathe. But, um, you know, if you take a little break, <laughs> you can open up. Yeah. to more things and because yeah. people get tense around that you know that binary thinking because it sets up a false conflict again yes. and you know and and then it brings in that sense of urgency that we've got to we've got to get to a point where we agree that my idea is the best one <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah um i just wanted to i i think a lot about and i, I think um one of the reasons i just want to be be open with the audience about why we are flip-flopping between the terminology um, either or thinking and the binary is because in Tema Okun's book, she actually uses the binary to talk about binary in a much, much larger context as this kind of either or mindset that we have, this very, very binary, yes, no, fast, slow, male, female. And I think a lot- in some ways that, in, in some ways I feel that Unitarian Universalists are a little bit ahead with LGBT issues, right? And one of the ways that I found to talk about either or thinking or binary thinking or binary mindset is to talk about gender. So um, that's something that, you know, we tend to think of gender as very binary. And if we push through that, then it it sometimes makes more sense when I talk to people when we say well gender's not binary so and and then it's like then all of a sudden it's like oh oh okay right so so we are um, I would say if you have some thoughts about how you deal with the binary please share them but we are right on target for time it is almost mind blowing. <laughs> so it's the time that we um, wanted, we've been monitoring the chat and it's been rich. I've loved watching what you guys have to say. And I wonder if there are um, questions that we have missed that have come up while you've been hearing these things. Yeah, so Lori, uh, if our tech guru would monitor, or if our tech guru would make the magic happen, and we'll do as best as we can, and I think we can hopefully get a lot done in a half hour. Okay, so how this will work best is if you 
want to ask a question, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question and then remute yourself when you're done. And as we, oh, you can also raise your hand like so. So first, you, Wichita just raised their hand. So go ahead and go for it. There. Now you are, you should be. Okay, I hope I'm audible. Reverend Carter from First UU, hi. And um, so I, I want to be useful in my comment or question. I'll start by saying uh, at GA in Oregon, I, I met Lynn Unger and I thanked her for her article in uh, Church of the Larger Fellowship where she held forth about her daughter who's an African-American child and how she wouldn't tell her daughter to stand her ground in the face of white authority because her daughter would likely be brutalized and possibly killed if she did that. And she ended her article by saying, so I'm going to stand ground for African Americans facing you know, oppression. Well, I thanked her for the article. I said that I've used it many times in my public speaking, both in my church and outside. So my question has to do with how to incorporate the relationships between persons who have been enculturated with white supremacy as just normative, and persons who, because of being people of color, have had a disparate experience of that, uh, you know, clearly know the risk that operating, just living in this context, produces for them. So I think something arises out of that relationship that doesn't arise if the conversation is exclusively among people who don't really have intimacy with black people and who do not understand firsthand and viscerally the risk that black people feel uh, perpetually in this context. Thank you. Um, I, wow, that was, I think we could probably go three hours just on that. Um, first of all, I, ju I just want to be clear that that the webinar that we're doing is an analysis of this particular work. Um, and the first thing I want to acknowledge is, and Tim Okuno acknowledges this in her analysis as well, is that white supremacy is actually enculturated in all of us. Whether or not we're white, I mean, that's the aspiration to be white, the safety of being white, right? The promise, the false promise that is made by two people of color, that if you behave like these things, if you are on time, if you are, you know, competitive, if you are better than everybody else, if you are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, some of those values tend to run counterculture to other cultures than our own. Um, so white supremacy in itself is enculturated in all of us because we have to often adopt these to survive regardless of our skin color. What I hear from you, I think, is that we need to also talk about privilege, which is, yes, of course, I, I would likely tell my child of color not to stand their ground particularly in today's climate. And let me tell you the deep fear I have for all of my friends, children, my friend of color's children, um, and the deep fear I live with in those relationships with them. Um, and the fact that one of the way we, ways we can exercise our privilege as white folks is to stand up. Um, and the other thing I heard from you is about relationships. I think that in the end, creating, or it, I think it is very difficult to do anti-racism work just in a white space with white people. I think white people have important work to do together to dismantle supremacy thinking in themselves, but we can't do it alone. We need to work in partnership. And one of the, the ARE is a partner organization with DRUM, right? ARE is a relational organization within Unitarian Universalism. Without a DRUM, 
there would be no ARE because we are in an accountable relationship with them. I don't know if I addressed exactly your, cause you had a lot of stuff that you said that was all awesome. And if you would be so kind and share Lynn Unger's, if somebody can uh, uh, get that link and if we could either put it on the website or whatever, I'd be, I'd love to read it again. So does that answer or help or yes work <laughs> yes i mean uh, am i i think i'm unmuting uh, uh ho hopefully i'm audible yes indeed i i just wanted to open it up and uh your comments were apropos and, and i'd just like to also be clear i know Lori called for questions and i think questions are really really important but I want to reiterate that we, we, a none of us have it all, and a none of us even have a whole lot of it. Um, we're we're hoping for the dialogue for us to learn too. You know, everybody has comes with different experiences, and that is and and that sometimes we hear the most amazing things. So it isn't just ask questions of us. It is if you have something to say that you've experienced that is a tactic that you've learned or a strategy that's working for you in, in anti-racism work, please, please do share. So Carolina, there's someone else that um, brought something oops, important in the chat, the topic of scarcity, you know, that she says isn't specifically listed in this outline, but uh, yeah, is definitely part of it. Um, that scarcity mindset keeps, again, it, it's a, it's a, method of perpetuating this system, this white supremacy culture, because um, it keeps, up, keeps us just scared enough <laughs> to make sure that we maintain everything we have and that um, if someone else is, you know, it's why, it's why there's such a response of anger when um, there's a perception that people of color are, you know, making progress or getting ahead. Um, because to white people, it feels like, unconsciously feels like they're losing somehow, right? Because we're, it's like, we're not doing quantity over quality this week, but right. Like we think there's a pie, right. And if other people are getting more, that means we must be getting less, right? Yeah, exactly. So that, yeah, that zero sum game. Yes. Um, and yeah. that is, that is very reinforced. I mean, we can, we can talk a lot about what we see in media you know, uh, about really the scare tactics. And I, I really would, would want to avoid political conversations in this because my God, we could just talk for hours and hours and hours how these traits are going up in our political discourse right now, right? But if we look at what media throws at us every single day is there will not be enough for you. There will not be enough for you if you don't whatever, right? And so with scarcity, I just, you know, I think there's a lot of wisdom that's passed down through the years that makes us think in the terms of community as opposed to, as opposed to just me. Um, and I think one of the things I do appreciate is that most of the people that I know who are hardcore doing this work are, 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 leaning more and more on that theology, right? That we are thinking in the terms of us. If, if, if you're not coming, like, if, if, if I can't bring you, right, then, then I'm going to stay until we can go together, right? And that's a lot easier for me to think about, Carrie, when I think about you <laughs> than when I think about Joe Arpaio, right? Yeah. But, and, and I'm not pushing myself to think about Joe Arpaio right now. I, I think about him plenty, but, but the, that is our challenge, right? Isn't that our spiritual work to think about us? And then that we, we, there is enough for all of us, you know, stone soup for the soul. So, um, absolutely. That is, that is our spiritual practice, um, to, uh, oh, I just lost the thought to go where, um, well, where it's not comfortable, 
and where it does get rough and there might be disagreement and we're not in the same place and you might have to wait for someone to catch up or you might have to wait for me to catch up. Um, but that's all part of developing that relationship and doing this work, which, you know, it won't surprise you that those of us on the ARE steering committee believe that that is the core of our, of our faith. <laughs> and I'm speaking for everyone. <laughs> Any other questions? We got anything in the chat? There seems to be a lot in the chat, which it would take me a while to catch up on. So there's a couple of things. One is um, from Yuri Yamamoto. Uh, she is she or he is asking um, about the binary and so a little bit more clarification on that. Um, and says, I was wondering about, in this context, what binary thinking we are referring to. I heard a couple of times right or wrong, but I have noticed a lot of black and white thinking. There are more than just black and white. I am yellow. Black and white thinking makes me invisible. So, so it's so funny because I'm, I'm listening to you, and I'm looking at the chat, and I'm about to type amen. Amen, Yuri. Thank you. Um, Yuri Yamamoto is a friend of mine, which has been a great privilege. Um, and yes, and I want to apologize for that, actually. Um, I know that right now, um, right now we are so cognizant of the Black Lives Matter movement. And I think so many of us are fervent and excited about the Black Lives Matter movement that we are using the term black a lot more than we are the term people of color, um, only because that is kind of like in the forefront of our mind. But yes, you are right, Yuri, and I apologize, and I will call you later and apologize again. Um, I, Thank you, Carolina. That, I think black lives matter thing, we understand and support. It's when white people say to me things like, we don't, consider you a person of color, you don't count as a diversity, we just want to have black people in our church. Those are the things that we don't like. Wow, Yuri, someone actually said that to you? Yes. Oh my. In you, your churches. Mm. Oh, that's forgiving and starting again. I am so sorry. That's okay. I. I believe that myself for a while, so. So. So that, I think about, I think about the binary there too, right? Um, that it is binary. And I also think about, um, wow. Group hug, somebody writes. Yes, I would like to, I wish I could hug a whole lot of you. Um, so, can I, can I just respond to a couple of things in the chat? Yes. Um, yeah, so uh, Jim, thanks for saying. Carrie, you're, Carrie, we can't hear you. Okay. No. Um, what Jim said on scarcity and abundance um, about what uh, white people can gain about doing anti-racism or anti-oppression work. Um, and that is really critical. You know, if we can understand, you know, as King said, how our, uh, we're bound up in a web of mutuality and that nobody is free until we're all free. That's the kind of spirituality we need to embrace and understand that. Um, as we're going forward. It's not about it's not about what we're losing and it's about what we're gaining because uh, white supremacy culture hurts us all. I realized that we had uh, a couple weekends ago we had our, our UU um, uh, trainer Chris Crass down here for a workshop um, that uh, was at our you know predominantly white congregation in Dallas. 
um, in a very affluent area, and he was talking about white supremacy culture, and we were going around the room, and it hit me for the first time, and I've been doing this work, you know, a long time, um, that I was looking at my spouse and how white supremacy culture has hurt him. And he's in every, you know, privileged category. <laughs> but the stress he feels, you know, as, um, you know, a man with a family in this culture, in this society, has taken a toll on his health. And so, um, so yes, we all have things to gain with, with ending it. Um, and then there was a comment, of, oh, the sense of urgency um, from Karen and Bev. Um, so there's, I just, there's a difference between a sense of urgency and having to work on this now, okay? And um, Carolina, maybe you wanna talk more on that. So I, have, I haven't read the chat, but I'm just, um, I, I did read some things that I think that you had written about um, people are talking about going slow and I just want to be really, really clear about uh, we are in no way promoting go, going slow around racial justice work. We're not. Um, it's, it's that I think in our culture, and I think in, in most of our churches, I, I kind of have the expectation that many people here are in some sort of lay or ministerial leadership roles or educational roles, um, where there is this rushedness about um, about everything we do, there's this pressure to make decisions and this pressure to perform. That's what we're talking about with sense of urgency. Internally, we're talking about our own personal impatience, which, you know, working on patience is an important thing. Does not mean, does not mean don't start now. Um, so, Okay, you know what, I just want to, we're going to take a, a, just a, a second to breathe, and I'm trying to understand your question, but I want to say there are people that have different time orientations. This is what I want to say. And most, many, 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 and almost most communities of color have what's called a longer-term time orientation, which does not you know, compartmentalize time into these tiny, tiny increments of microseconds. And that's a whole different way of looking at the world. And our sense of urgency, I think the critique that Tema Okun makes and the critique that I often make is we believe that everything needs to be minute by minute and you have to be on time to the meeting. And if you're not on time to the meeting, then you're being rude. And if you're a person of color, you're being even ruder, okay? Let's just be clear about why people catch a break for being late to meetings. Right? Nobody's thinking that that we're that we're lazy, right? Um, or we don't care, right? But there are many cultures that live on a different time orientation, and where it's okay. I have a Native American friend who lives right down the street from me on the Salt River Pima Reservation. She always jokes, and uh, she always jokes that when her relatives say they're coming for the weekend, she can expect them between Thursday and next Wednesday because their time orientation is very different. It is about what is important now. If something is critical at home, they are not rushing to be on time to the meeting or on time for the visit. If something happens along the way, they're not going to rush to show up, you know, by Friday night, midnight, so they're there on the weekend. Um, Hofstede did a really, really great um, great work around time orientation and we have a video actually and some resources we want to share with you that'll prompt further kind of thinking about how we think about time so if that will hold we are down to kind of like last nine minutes that's right and I want to jump in here um, while we're talking about urgency and slowing things down. I want to go back to um, my good friend Chris Buja's question, when does slowing things down in response to great sense of urgency become a tactic of delay and avoidance? And he's talking about how our congregations can drag out the process of whether 
to display a Black Lives banner or not. Um, and I, I, I'd love to hear what you guys think about it. I, um, at that conference that Chris Kress was, I brought, I bought a Black Lives Matter um, sign and I brought it back and uh, I preached about it last week about whether it would be okay for me just to put it in the yard. Would anybody care like the way that I put up a rainbow flag? Nobody said anything. Everybody was, that was fine. But the pushback around Black Lives Matter is real in our congregations. Um, and, and there's fear and, um, you know, I, I, I don't have an answer, Chris, and I don't know if anyone else does, of, of how you balance that slow moving of church time, especially around issues that are hard to talk about. I, um, so I have, I have reviewed the chat feed, and I have a better understanding of the question right now, and I think Donna really brought it to where, where it is. I think when we do this analysis, right, we are looking at the ways white supremacy continues to marginalize and continues to exclude. And I think it would be my very instant and almost flippant analysis that if we are dragging our heels around putting up a Black Lives Matter sign, this has nothing to do with sense of urgency. This has to do with conflict avoidance, right? If our sense of urgency and our importance on um, punctuality and things like that serve to exclude people who are historically marginalized, then I think you've got a sense of urgency problem. Right. I think one of the reasons this tool is helpful is we can look at something that's happening and say, well, what is it really that's happening? This has nothing to do with time itself, other than you clearly want it to happen faster. Right. And maybe you need to think about your own impatience. Maybe it's just like your train isn't going to go that fast. But what is happening in front of you is conflict avoidance. Does that does that make a little bit more sense in respect to your question? Pooja, are you here? Let me see. And I also wanted to say that I noticed, I think it's the group in Wichita, that there was someone standing right in front of the camera for a long time. Did you, did y'all have a question that didn't get answered? I think what you saw was um, Reverend Carter was typing a comment, the comment about Native Americans being marginalized. Okay. Okay, I just wanted to make sure we didn't miss it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I just, just want to affirm that comment. You know, that's, that's absolutely true about indigenous peoples. So it looks to me like the chat is just going crazy and I'm a very slow reader and a very fast talker. <laughs> um, I was wondering if, so I'm looking at the time, we have about five minutes for wrap up. If somebody who reads faster than I am, I do, can maybe look at the chat and do maybe a summary in response to it. Um, and if anybody has any comments, questions, advice, or we'd love, you know, in these last four minutes now, haha, -ha, um, our sense of urgency increases. Um, it, it, does anybody have any feedback about this format? I know this is, it's a difficult format in which to have a conversation, but we are, re we would be really happy to take your feedback and try and make next week better. And I'd also urge, um, go to the event page and provide feedback there if you want. That's, that's absolutely fine because we can, you can do that afterwards ap after reflection. Thank you. And so um, when you do that, I would like to request and challenge you all to um, 
maybe demonstrate some of your learnings from tonight when you do that. <laughs> <laughs> so we can support one another and move forward in this work because that's the most important thing yes thank you all for being here thank you John and Lou for the appreciation we appreciate you all gathering the, pl the places where several of you gathered that was just wonderful to see and um, you know we're hoping that this is a way that we can reach people um, beyond just members of ARE. Several of you said we're not members of ARE. You do not have to be to do this work. We and, want to facilitate your work wherever you are. Yeah, and even if you are an ARE member, but you never get together with another ARE member <laughs> as well. And I'd also like to just invite everyone, if they are interested, to uh, join us right after this meeting for um, a Wednesday Connect with the Church of the Larger Fellowship, particularly for white parents who parent people of color and children of color. So if you're interested in that, I'm going to put the URL in the chat as well. And thank you so and much for Lori and the Church of the Larger Fellowship for making this possible. Oh my gosh, thank you, thank you, CLF. Whoa, Meg, you guys rock. I love what you do. My church, my church. And so, yes, we are having um, another one next. Is it next week? Where's my next calendar? Wednesday. Next tonight. Wednesday. Same time. Yeah, so we're going to finish um, doing um, Tema's... Um, all these points and then uh, there are other um, ARE members, uh, steering committee members who are going to do two more series leading up to GA. So later on, if you guys all say this worked for you, then we're going to keep doing it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So thank you. I, I think, shall we give Lori a moment to breathe and just end a minute early? I think so. Well, we just, yeah, we, we, it's fine. Uh, we're in a separate room, so thank you so much. But that link I just put in, it's clfuu.org slash Wednesday hyphen connect. And that would take you, redirect you to the next uh, uh, Zoom, Zoom window. Great. So, Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you. We hope yes. to see most of you next week. Yes, and yes, those closing words, our humanity is all tied together. So thank you all for participating. Good night. Good night. Good night.